So I'd like to introduce the, the first session, or technician's intro into software-defined networking. And I would like to welcome Rich Dussome, President and CEO of SendGen, Canada's Centre of Excellence in Next Generation Networks. He has held the position since its inception in September of 2014 and is also a board member of the organization for Open Platform uh, NFV Ambassador. For those of you who don't know, SendGen is Ontario, federal and industry-funded consortium focused on next generation networking. And it includes areas such as open compute data center, software defined networking, network function virtualization, internet of things, and open standard. So everyone, big round of applause. Let's hear it for Rich. All right, uh, good morning everyone. So uh, how many people are experts in SDN here? Anyone? Okay, good. I was just gonna get you to teach this course. Uh, so normally, uh, this is actually with ourselves, it's a uh, one to three day course, and I'm going to try and my best uh, to get some ideas straight in uh, 30 minutes. So if you know the acronym, you know some of the uh, attributes, then we're all good. Um, so let's get started here. Now talk a little bit about um, why this is relevant, and just very quickly, because uh, how we, we got organized or how we got started with Sengen was actually solving this particular problem that Canada uh, has been falling behind. Um, and uh, just last year, from a network readiness perspective, um, from the World Economic Forum, we Canada slipped from 11th to 14th position. And I don't know about anyone in this room, but I'm not happy about that. And I'd like to actually uh, see what we can do about that. So we're going to be focused on that. Um, and that's really what uh, um, the premise in terms of what Sengen is actually trying to accomplish. So this is our organization. Um, it's a, a little bit of a complex ecosystem, but we are industry-based, okay? So why is a, an industry guy here talking at an academia uh, session? Well, uh, it's because obviously we are plugged in at the hip, right? So we are using uh, a lot of uh, students as well as professors in terms of projects uh, and uh, you know, working uh, on a particular SME uh, innovations or SME commercialization projects. Um, we have the innovators who are the small Ontario and Canadian companies, okay? And those are the ones that have the ideas, those are the ones that uh, the large members and partners on the bottom left end is actually looking for. So these are the large companies that effectively work in a coopetition. we heard that word earlier. Um, and what that means is that they collaborate when you know we're together at Sengen, but when they leave the door, they compete on a global basis, right? Um, in terms of uh, government, we are funded by the federal government, um, as well as uh, recently announced in the Ontario budget. Uh, we were funded to uh, create a Ontario-wide uh, innovation cloud, which I'm going to talk about a little bit. So let's talk about SDN. <clears throat> now, software-defined networking, if you, it's, it's hard to talk about the technology without looking at the business, because otherwise, uh, you're playing with technology for the sake of technology. No one has a time for that. No one has a stomach for that either. But what's happening is there's a ton of innovation going on. There's a pretty decent market. So the total addressable market uh, is expected to be over $100 billion, right? And this is a gigantic market. So why, what problems, why are they trying to solve? And with software-defined infrastructure, basically we're using the same technology that a lot of the, a lot of the large public cloud providers uh, such as Google and Amazon and so on are actually using themselves, okay? And uh, so effectively, a couple of things about SDN. Number one is that the data plane and the control plane are separate. So the control plane is like the brain and the data plane is what forwards the traffic. So those have been separated. And what that means is that you actually have a centralized control mechanism and there's APIs basically between uh, the different layers. And I'll show a few slides on that. Closely related is NFE, network function virtualization. So that's taking uh, what normally is a piece of hardware, like a firewall, a session border controller, and virtualizing it so that's a piece of software, it's an app, it sits in the cloud. You don't know where it is, you don't care where it is, as long as you can access it and you can use it. And what's driving a lot of this is the IoT market, Internet of Things. So you've got all these devices, I think everyone in this room probably has at least 10, 15 devices, right? And they're probably all, maybe interconnected to different clouds, maybe it's in your own network at home and so on, but eventually they're all gonna to need to be tied together. And so these are effectively driving that market. So 
it's one thing to, to have uh, you know, software-defined infrastructure, you have an open platform, but you actually have to have the supporting organization, the people, process, and platform surrounding it. And that's what we've done at Sengen, basically, is making sure that you kind of eat your own dog food. Okay, so you can't, uh, you, you can't develop, you can't actually make changes to this infrastructure. You actually have to live it, you have to be part of it, okay? And uh, when you hear about open source, you always hear the, hey, this, this is free. Well, there's no free lunch anywhere, right? It, you actually have to invest in the people, you have to invest in the infrastructure and the process. So we are running a DevOps uh, shop, um, so agile methodology for those folks that are in the software development business daily scrums, bi-weekly sprints, and so on. Um, and then of course, you know, we have the appropriate team with the skill set uh, to basically help our small companies commercialize. All right, so you're gonna hear from uh, a little bit later from uh, an ONF rep, but this is a basically what their view of, uh, of software-defined infrastructure is. Okay, so again, if you look at the diagram, it's very, very simple. You have the uh, control plane and the data plane uh, are decoupled. Uh, effectively, you're going to a centralized control. In theory, the equipment can be simpler. Okay, when, you, when each device is made simpler, in theory, it should be cheaper, it should be easier. Okay, that's the concept. Uh, and then, of course, what users are concerned about in a cloud is their applications. They don't really care about the infrastructure. This crowd today, we care, right? So. We're, we're networking people. Now this is a slide that I borrowed from my friends at Cisco Systems, uh, and at a, this was given at a Cisco Live uh, back in Australia. And I think it actually indicates quite nicely the, the separation of the control plane and data plane in terms of what this would look like in a, you know, in a pure definition perspective, right? So you got the brain sitting at the central location, um, and effectively the data plane which is down uh, in the devices. Now, uh, this is a lot of, uh, you know, kind of, I think it could be debated, you know, what SDN is. There's a lot of, there's a lot of buzz around it. Um, there's a lot of hard work, quite frankly, and there's a lot of things that are being defined. It's changing on a fairly regular basis, okay? So I will agree it's bigger than a bread box. This is not trivial technology. Uh, we've been at it approaching three years, and, and every day we're learning, and we're learning, and you're learning. And... You, you realize that when you actually understand something, there's a hundred things that you don't understand, right? So it's one of those things, if you're one of those folks that needs to understand everything, uh, good luck with that one. But it, it does mean that we are gonna have to collaborate. Uh, so that's something that some of us maybe aren't used to. You know, if you're, you know, you worked at a large company, I used to work for Cisco Systems, it's a very large, uh, powerful development shop, but imagine that even as big as they are, they're gonna need an ecosystem to actually help develop their products and solutions. I really like this slide because it gives you a view uh, from many different aspects, right? You have the OSI uh, on the left-hand side here, so you have the OSI stack in terms of various layers. And then in the, on the left-hand, uh, you have the various uh, planes. So you have the management plane, uh, which is effectively control. Um, uh, sorry, managing the devices, you have the control plane. Uh, which is effectively, um, you know, the instructions that are given down to the equipment, and then you have the data plane where things actually happen, okay? And then you have the layers that actually define all of the, the applications, the interfaces that are between the layers. You have the, the network operating system, you have the hypervisor, um, and then, of course, you have the southbound interface, and then at the far end, you actually have the architecture. Now, I love these architecture diagrams because, you know, when you're trying to show people, hey, this, you should move to this architecture, it's always simple, right? It always looks nice and clean and it's always simple. So, as we know, that's not always the case. Okay, so conventional networks versus software defined. So, if you were, let's say, uh, building networks over the past, I don't know, 20 years or so, uh, you might, your network may look like this on the top hand side, right? Where you have you know, many physical devices, they're all connected, there's routers, switches, firewalls, whatever is involved. In the case of, of software-defined infrastructure, basically what you have is a programmable cloud. Okay, so a lot of what you're doing is actually in software. So um, our engineers, when they put together our cloud, they basically build it once. Okay, so you, you put all your cabling, you put in your design, um, and after that, you don't touch it. You actually program it, okay, and you use it. 
Um, and so that's basically what's being described in the bottom. So you have what are people concerned about is really the applications that are running on top of it. And then we're interested because we're a, a networking group and of course so is Orion and, and its members. And so this is, we view this as an infrastructure uh, that, that we actually would use to interconnect uh, all of our users. Um, but also uh, we need to build our partition and scale it. Okay, and that's so effectively what software-defined infrastructure lets you do. Now, uh, this is another slide that I borrowed for Cisco. So what are the use cases? So who cares? Big deal, right? So SDN's cool, it's complex, it's really smart. You get this on your resume, you're gonna get a job, all that good stuff. Well, you have to have use cases, right? And so the primary use cases I talked about earlier is this NFE. So when you have applications in the cloud, uh, you know, where is it actually being run? What order you know, of the sequencing should it be? Where is it actually uh, going to be? Uh, there, there's the abstraction layer, there's traffic engineering, so in terms of you know, making sure that you know how to configure your network. And ideally, you want it actually to happen based on your pre-programmed rules, right? So you've determined what are the policies, and then basically the network should configure that way. And then, of course, uh, rapid service deployment. Um, you know, in the software-based models, um, many companies are able to very quickly change their features and function. Right? Like I heard Facebook is like twice a day they update the software, Facebook still works, right? Uh, I used to work for a large service provider. When you brought in a new feature, it could have taken six, nine months. Could have been longer, who knows, depending on the capability and the function. But this is something that once you've actually built it, once you're using it, it's programmable. And some pros and cons, this is mainly for, uh, you know, if you're looking at actually dabbling in the space, um, you know, there's some, definitely some benefits in terms of scale, potential cost reduction. I don't know if that's a, if that's a, a real, because maybe you're moving from a CapEx model to an OpEx model. At the end of the day, I don't know if you actually have saved any dollars, but you do get the benefit of actually being able to, once it's built, uh, very rapid deployment and, uh, you know, being able to move very quickly, be very agile. Now, let's switch gears and talk about some of the software-defined networking uh, groups as well as uh, some of the history behind it, right? So, so OpenStack basically is uh, one of those uh, organizations. They just had a, I think they do uh, three uh, summits per year. I just came back from Boston. And uh, I think there's about, I don't know, eight or 10,000 people. So this is actually very large. It's effectively, uh, it's a cloud operating system. Of course, it's based on Linux. Uh, and it's uh, part of the SDN ecosystem. And uh, at Sengen, we use uh, OpenStack uh, Cloud extensively, as you're going to hear from our other members or the other presenters as well. Um, so this is real. It's not something that's happening in the future. It's happening now, and it's being used by a large, of, large uh, public cloud as well as a lot of uh, service providers and enterprise customers. So there's a convergence that's actually taking place. So where did it get started was actually... Uh, a couple of organizations, uh, NASA and one of the public uh, cloud providers, Rackspace, right? And it happened in an impromptu, uh, you know, at a, I believe it was a weekend meeting, and they sketched some stuff out, and that actually became uh, the architecture of what really OpenStack was based on. So uh, very cool roots, and uh, there's many, many things happening. Uh, the one thing that I find really neat is that the uh, leader of OpenStack is actually a Canadian, Okay, so that's kind of a, kind of a cool thing. Um, there's many, many projects that are taking place uh, in the OpenStack, so in the software-defined uh, network infrastructure. So you have compute, uh, you have storage, you have network. So there's network controllers. So, and anyone actually can participate in these sessions, right? So it doesn't have to be, uh, you know, large companies. It could be anyone that actually can contribute, whether it be documentation, what have you. So. Um, you know, we are involved uh, in a few of the areas that are important to Sengen and our members, okay? So, um, but there's a lot happening. Uh, in terms of OpenFlow, this is, I'm just going to tell you what the description is. You're going to hear a bit, a bit more later. Uh, effectively, it's one of the uh, protocols that's used in OpenStack, right? So it defines the L2 protocol basically between uh, the devices, okay? So it's... Uh, when you hear that term, there's many other solutions, by the way. That's one of them. Now, 
In terms of uh, open, I, I like the theme of uh, Orion uh, Summit this year is actually open and basically Sengen was built on the premise of open right from the get-go. Okay, so you take a bunch of companies, you, you get them to collaborate, and what you actually get is a cloud that effectively looks like the organizations are on the bottom, and then you see AT&T and you go, well, what's AT&T doing on this slide? They're a large service provider, right? Well, they're trying to transform their company because they believe that their competition is not Verizon, it's actually Google, right? And if Google has this rapid cloud software deployment scenario, how could AT&T ever compete with that? And so basically they're very quickly uh, you know, trying to transform themselves. So this is something that you should uh, take a look at. Um, in terms of uh, standards and, and open source, um, I think what's happening in the industry is actually very interesting. Like if you look at 5G, for example, which is the next generation of mobile uh, standards, uh, it's due to come out in 2020. Okay, so I believe it took about five years. Now, if you go to the Linux Foundation or any of the open source groups, they're going to say five years. I mean, that's forever, right? So this is, we got to move a little quicker than that. And they're used to, hey, here's a piece of software, go try it. Did it work? No? Okay, well, bring it back and, uh, you know, let's, uh, I'll give you something next week. And so there's some very interesting things that are happening uh, from, so both from an open source uh, and a standards group. And I think that they're both are required and both are going to have to kind of come together. So very interesting. And anyway, we're very active uh, in uh, the Etsy group, particularly uh, Etsy NFEI architecture. And I'll describe that uh, role as part of our OPNFE, uh, where we're associate member. So why is this important to SDN? Okay. Well, the main reason why we're involved in OPNFE is because this is an organization where they're trying to get SDN, OpenStack, all of the various layers based on the Etsy NFI model to actually work together. Because this is complex. Like OpenStack, OpenFlow on its own, they're all individually very complex. But when you start looking at all the different aspects uh, of the various projects that are going on in both the standards bodies as well as in the Linux Foundation, it's gigantic. So imagine trying to put all that stuff together, test it as a system so it can be deployed. And that's what we're interested in. So we're interested in more from a user perspective. By the way, um, for those folks that are interested, the uh, the, the Danube, so OPNFE does uh, four, sorry, two releases per year. They're based on rivers. And so Danube just came out, I think, about a month ago. And Euphrates, uh, I believe, is coming out in the September time frame. Okay, so, and with it will come new features and function. So, why should you care? Well, a lot of projects that are happening are based on use cases that the industry is going to be deploying, okay? And from an academia perspective, when you look at those scenarios, I bet you a lot of them are not different from what you're actually trying to do within your own infrastructures. So um, we, we believe, you know, sticking to a much larger organization that is actually trying to drive industry standard and actually get stuff to work is actually a good use of our time, and that's why we're involved. The, the other thing that's really neat about what they do is they have this concept of continuous integration, continuous development labs, okay? And uh, so what that allows you to do on a very regular basis, because you have this open community where you have thousands and tens of thousands of developers, how do you keep track of that stuff? How do you know it works? How do you know that someone didn't break some of your stuff? Well, you have to test it on a regular basis. And so they have a number of labs that are going, and uh, basically it will allow you to, to test this. This is something we have a, an environment uh, in, uh, uh, in Ottawa at Sengen, and basically this, uh, we're planning to make it available to students as well as small Canadian companies. So if there's something that you would like to get involved in, you want to test some scenario, this is basically a configuration that can be used for that. So it's a, we think it could be very interesting from a student perspective, uh, as well as a, uh, a project perspective for various university programs. All right, and this is effectively the, the testing community and why you know, it's relevant is because uh, these are the tests that are going to be run that large cloud providers and large service providers are going to use. So we actually believe that there's value there to actually understand how things are actually being developed, 
Okay, so if you're familiar with uh, ONAP in terms of the orchestration of the SDN environment, that's something that just came together at the recent ONS. Um, and this is something that the OPNFE group is going to be testing and uh, will want to be a part of it. Okay, so what are the next steps? Why is it relevant? Um, well, it's relevant for this reason is um, recently uh, about uh, whatever the Ontario government uh, announced the, uh, the budget, in there was uh, uh, one of the line items was actually the Sengen cloud expansion. Okay, so what we plan to do is uh, connect um, the large innovation hubs, which are uh, Mars here in Toronto, Communitech in Kitchener-Waterloo, uh, and West Ottawa. Those are the big locations. And then we have 15 other regional innovation centers, uh, which go up to you know, northern Ontario, southern Ontario, all across the province. So basically cities that are over 150,000 effectively. And this is going to be an open cloud, so this will be effectively running OpenStack. Okay, and what it'll allow is for small companies and uh, you know universities who actually have, a, say, an acceleration or innovator program to validate their technology over this infrastructure. Because if you think about it, this is not uh, you know Ottawa versus Toronto versus Waterloo. Uh, this is not Ontario versus Quebec versus BC. This is kind of Canada versus India versus China. Right? Like that's the battle, right? And in, in terms of being able to collaborate, uh, especially on the innovations, that's something that we think is actually going to be very valuable. And uh, obviously we'd like the academia uh, portion of Ontario, specifically the Orion Group, um, to participate. Now, we are discussing uh, with Orion of uh, them providing the uh, infrastructure that the Sengen Cloud will run on. Okay, so we'll, have, we'll be running an SDN cloud, but we don't want to put in infrastructure that already exists, in particular where the province has made investment through the Orion network. So we plan to take advantage of that as well. All right, so in terms of, oh, sorry, let me go back. Um, so I don't want to stay uh, just in Ontario. We do have a, a view of doing this across the country. And so imagine uh, one open standard cloud uh, where we could use to collaborate uh, based on, you know, these various over-the-top technologies and verticals where, you know, uh, ideally would make sense to, to have Canada be more competitive in the digital economy in areas that are, you know, basically changing people's lives, right? So, uh, again, technology not for the sake of technology, but uh, I was at OC Discovery last week and I sat in on a, the Ontario... Uh, health care budget, I think, is $56 billion a year, okay? And imagine if we could apply some technology, get some innovation uh, that, you know, could we actually help? Because uh, we know that health care costs are going to go up as, as we get older. Is there some technology, some innovation that can happen that can actually make us, uh, you know, our quality of life better, all right? Okay, so... Uh, in terms of, again, you know, bringing it back to SDN, Software Defined Networking, what's in the square box is effectively what we built and what we're going to be building, all right? Now, in terms of, you, talk, you hear things like smart city and, you know, smart infrastructure and so on. Um, effectively, what we want to do is to, at, at the city level at, or at the town level, municipality, whatever you want to call it, at the provincial level as well as across the country, we would like to have a software defined infrastructure that basically would allow us to collaborate when we want to. Okay, so effectively building a you know virtual superhighway that can be configured dynamically within minutes and hours versus weeks and months and years. Um, another one of the projects that uh, we're going to get involved in. This is actually the Ontario government asked us to do this is um, because we have a lot of service provider members, uh, folks like uh, Rogers, TELUS, Bell Canada, and so on, and a lot of the large equipment um, manufacturers, such as Nokia, Cisco, Juniper, and so on, um, these folks are very active uh, members within Sengen. They all believe in, in the Canadian ecosystem. And right now we have a fundamental problem with broadband internet that's rural and remote. Okay, so rural in a sense that like, you know, I'm in the city of Ottawa, but when you go, let's say, you know, five minutes from, let's say, the major portion of the city, the internet's crappy, 
okay? Uh, same thing for remote communities, you know, like there's basically no internet there. So what folks are doing, they're moving to the cities, they're effective these towns without any internet, they're absolutely useless, right? So um, I would like some help uh, from the academia community on this open broadband uh, architecture. So what the thought that we have is imagine uh, having, you know, things like white box uh, hardware, so relatively low cost hardware, both in the wired and in the wireless space. 5G is going to play a role because you can't run fiber to every single house in Ontario and Canada. It'll take you, you know, 15 years. It may happen over time, uh, but I don't think any of us want to wait 15 years. Um, and then have that combination with uh, fiber technology, but shoot for the moon in terms of let's actually target gigabit access right, so that Canada can become a leader, and there's some technology problems that we need to solve, right, so Canada's a very large country, of course, Ontario's a very large province, but imagine if we actually built uh, an open architecture, this would be available so that effectively anyone could participate, okay, so I definitely uh, would like uh, to invite, if you're interested, uh, please come and see us, and uh, over the next five years, uh, you're going to hear a lot more based on this, and how this plugs back into the cloud uh, that we were talking about for the province as well as for the country. Okay, and uh, that's all for now. So I don't know how you want to handle the questions, if you want to do them now or do them at the end. Okay, uh, any, uh, we have a couple minutes, I think, if anyone had any questions about what we described. Okay, so thank you very much. That was absolutely fantastic, Reg. There was, uh, there was a lot of information in those slides. Very powerful stuff. All right, so the next tech stream that we're moving into is SDN and the state of OpenFlow and the Open Networking Foundation. So with this, I'd like to welcome Yatish Kumar. Yatish leads courses, technical vision, as well as supporting SDN OpenFlow direction in the broader industry as the Open Networking Foundation's area director for all published specifications. He also sits on the ONF's Chip Makers Advisory Board. Yatish has more than 23 years of networking industry experience. Welcome, Yatish. All right, ready to go. Um, so I am here to, uh, I guess, represent ONF, but it's a very simple thing to represent. ONF pretty much doesn't exist anymore. And so within the last uh, uh, three months or so, um, it uh, got merged with a different organization called ON Labs. Um, and this was, uh, This was, this was basically um, a decision that was made by the board, the ONF board, uh, which consists of those companies that, that Rich had. And so the CTO of AT&T, for example, someone from the CTO's group in Deutsche Telekom, uh, Urs uh, Holzi, who is the chief, uh, the very head of, uh, of infrastructure at Google. These are the people that, that sat on that board, and they created ONF about uh, three or four years ago in order to follow the mission uh, that, uh, that Rich was kind of talking about. But after three or four years, they felt that uh, the whole thing had uh, grown in, a, in, in an incorrect direction. And uh, in order to, to correct things and, and take it in a, in a, in, in a new, different uh, uh, sort of um, operating mode, uh, they felt that, uh, that they needed to basically shut down the operations of ONF and, uh, and rethink the, the whole uh, idea of, what, uh, of how to drive open networking. And, and the big rethink was that ONF was a standards organization. They published the, and developed the OpenFlow standard, for example, so that lots of different people could work together in order to have an interoperable um, communication language, in this case, and a, and a configuration system for programming switches. It was a standard. Um, 
but then the standards body grew and people did 5G extensions to it and uh, transport extensions and, and the thing had gotten into this large sort of rolling standards uh, operating mode. Uh, but nothing really complete or compelling was coming out of that activity. Um, a lot of people sat in rooms uh, similar to this and they talked about things and they kind of made incremental suggestions for how to add SGN to 5G, for example. But the ITU is really deciding how 5G is going to go. And, and so the way they wanted to make things more effective was actually by developing code rather than standards. And so they, they closed down the, the standards operation and they merged it with a, with a group that does coding. Um, and that indirectly happens to be the Linux Foundation. <laughs> And so instead of talking about ONF, it's, it's more relevant if I try and explain what's going on with the Linux Foundation because ONF has become a very small part of that. And so um, this little thing here uh, represents the work of o ON Labs, which is part of what Linux Foundation uh, is sort of fostering. Um, and so the players that, that come out of the, the sort of the Berkeley, Stanford, Google, uh, open networking um, sort of clique direct that work. Um, open Daylight is a, is a different body of work. It's something that IBM and Cisco and a bunch of others started in order to take their stab at how to build uh, open infrastructure in order to build large scale frameworks and so on. There's OPNFV and all of these other things. And Linux Foundation has over time realized that there are all these related uh, projects that people have been doing. And so they've been bringing them in house. Uh, they usually come with a, you know, a few million dollars worth of supported funding. And, and Linux Foundation assigns management offices to it. And they sort of run these, these operations now at a pretty decent scale so that they can be successful. But, because each of these is a, is a very large sort of community software development thing. So you could have a few thousand uh, developers, even though they're, they're, con they're volunteers or contributors from companies, working together on projects of that scale. And so, um, so that's kind of what has happened is that ONF has, has sort of gone into the core ONOS ON lab world. And all these other projects happen to carry on on their own because they never had anything to do with ONF in the first place. Um, but that's just the Linux Foundation. <laughs> it doesn't represent all open source. And so what I want to do uh, in, in my talk is um, I've set the context for what's going on in a, in a very broad sense with, uh, with open networking. You can see that there are all these very large sort of rolling projects. Uh, they're large infrastructure projects. If you look at what uh, Rich is describing, you know, it's huge in terms of scope and scale and tying in agriculture and healthcare and everything else. Um, but what I want to do is, is have you think about it from your perspective. Um, are you the kind of person uh, that's here because you want to contribute to something of that scale? Or are you somebody who has a little bit of spare time and you want to do some uh, open networking or you want to do some DevOps? Um, how do these large projects uh, impact you? And, or are there other choices you should think about <laughs> that are more relevant to the problem you want to solve? Um, so just so I can, I can understand the audience a little bit, um, how many of you uh, would describe yourselves as, as computer scientists or people who develop networking protocols? That's your primary interest. One person. Um, how many would uh, describe yourselves as as people who operate networks, so whether it's a campus network or a regional network or ah, quite a few. And how many of you are security centric? Uh, not bad. So, so this is the first thing to to realize is that with uh, with programmable networks, there's an inherent assumption that you want to program. <laughs> or you want to develop protocols, or you want to fiddle with things. Uh, whereas typically people that operate networks, when they run into a problem in, in their operations, they do want to fiddle. But they don't wake up every morning going, I, I really want to solve a networking problem today, and I'm going to do it with my computer science uh, hat on. Um, and 
if you're not the person that wants to spend tremendous amounts of time programming networks, then are programmable networks the right thing for you? Or are you better off thinking about how you operate your network better and use the equipment that's been given to you, whether it's open source uh, white box equipment with, uh, with pre-designed solutions control planes, or whether it's automating something relatively simple by, by writing a Perl script and, and looking at log messages. Um, all of that falls into the category of, of, of programming a network, but you're doing it at a scale in order to solve a problem that's interesting to you. Um, so, so to understand what I'm, I'm going to talk about um, next, um, I want to set some context. And so this is what the internet was in 1973. It was very, very small, right? And the most campus networks, I think, are of the scale or, or bigger. And the effort and energy and the number of people it took in a room in order to sort out problems when they were trying to build a network like that is tremendously different from what it takes now to make a change that affects IP protocols or the internet or the way we communicate with, uh, with TCP IP protocols on top of it. Um, and because things have, have grown to that scale, um, the, things that used, the problems that people used to solve back then feel untenable for most of us at this time because we can't fundamentally change uh, the way protocols work uh, today without going through some very complicated process of standardization, adoption, and so on. Um, and so, you know, there's a scale problem here. And that little network, if they really did something horrible, they could probably all agree to shut it down for a night, and then on Thursday morning, they would bring the whole thing back up. You can't do that with the internet. You can't reboot the internet and everybody sort of rework some of the fundamental uh, core protocols that are operating the, the internet. And so now we have a new problem, which is how do we, how do we move from here and not 100 years from now still be running the same internet? How do we evolve the internet at some reasonable pace in order to have it catch up with new objectives and new goals? And that's sort of the, the guiding principle for uh, what people at Stanford and Berkeley and Google and AT&T think about. And that's the context that they're thinking about when they create the Open Networking Foundation or uh, ON Labs and, and, uh, and, and so on. That's what they're trying to do. Um, and so, the, uh, because it's, uh, it has become this problem, uh, there's uh, sort of a, a school of thought uh, which says, well, we can't. We can't, we can't uh, fundamentally rework uh, uh, the, the architecture of, of IP at this point. Um, but what we can do is, within our own limited context, uh, build uh, a private network or a private set of protocols or an overlay network. And within our small context, the topology of the network, it might not be any bigger than that picture in 1973. And we can uh, start by proving in and developing concepts that if they hold true in a few years will propagate because other people will copy the concept and it'll just make sense for everybody and so on. And so Google, for example, has slowly uh, reworked the, the notion of using TCP IP in order to connect their web browser to their servers. Uh, they've moved to UDP. <laughs> um, but it was all done under the covers, and it was done in a very private context because the Google Chrome browser talks to the Google web servers. It's a very contained problem. A few people in a room can solve it. And so that, those are the types of examples for how uh, fundamental things like how a web browser communicates with a web server on the, on, in the cloud can actually change without a, a lot of drama and, and sort of confusion about the, the literally millions of people involved in networking today. Um, now, I'm going to skip through a whole bunch of slides uh, because, you know, given the glazed look in the audience, um, we don't really need to go into the, the, the depth of, of overlay underlay networks and virtualization and so on. Um, but the point The point is that um, if, you, if you describe how networking works today, um, for most uh, networking architectures that are end-to-end, -end, uh, it's broken into two parts. Uh, there is the notion of taking your payload 
and packing it into something. It could be an encapsulation, it could be in an IPv4 packet, it could be in a VXLAN um, header. There is the notion of taking your data, packing it into some sort of packet protocol, and handing it off to somebody who moves that data for you. And then the person who does the movement of the data, whether it's your campus backbone router, or whether it's Orion, or if it's the entire internet, uh, those people are expecting to, to move data in some relatively well-known contained package formats. And so there's the notion of loading and packing packets, and then there's the notion of moving those packets. And when you talk about technologies for moving packets, there are actually not that many. You're either doing an IP network or an MPLS network. That's pretty much it. And so the innovation in networking, if you really want to change things uh, using the concept of, of your own little uh, networking domain or your own little problem that you're trying to solve without bringing consensus across the entire internet, is a packing problem. It's, a, it's an edge problem. It's how more innovatively or better can you put your data into your, uh, your FedEx package without having to worry about how the FedEx package actually then gets moved from Ottawa to Toronto. Because the pro there are relatively few problems moving packages around uh, from one place to another. The protocols we have are already very good. And so I've spent a lot of time in the last three years uh, going to and interacting with a number of RNE networks, um, GEON, TSNet, I2, regionals all over the world. And for three years, the, there has been a lot of discussion about, well, what problem do we have? Why, what are we trying to innovate on? And it's very rarely a problem related to moving data around. And more often, it's about how do I expose my service in a way that's more interesting to my customers? And so if I have to connect a radio telescope, why is that special and different from connecting supercomputers together? And, and it turns out, when you get into the details, it is a different problem. And they have different requirements in terms of how they want to connect and, and, and move things. And all of those are, are, are edge problems. They're the adaptation of your data. Um, but the data doesn't move anywhere. Uh, when you adapt from the edge to your transport system, you're in the same room, or you're in the same rack, or you're in the same card. Um, and so there's no real notion of moving a distance when you're talking about packing at the edge. The moving a distance part of networking, which is the most important function of networking, is actually core networking. And so, um, when you talk about security, for example, right? So what the, uh, the security problem is an edge problem. It's, it's things that are happening to you because the protocols, the web servers, the things that are connected to the network have vulnerabilities in them. The security problem is not a core MPLS problem. It's not a transport problem. It's not a, a distance carrying problem. Um, if you talk about uh, efficiency of data transfers, it's an edge problem. Did you overload the network? Did you cause congestion because you were blind to, to what you were asking for? And so, as you sit here in the room and you listen to me, um, you might be responsible, say, for the, the Toronto District School Board, or you might be responsible for libraries, or, uh, or a supercomputing center in Toronto, or whatever. Um, what does any of that have to do with the Linux Foundation and, and the technologies that they're putting together? Um, I think the, the, the sense of scale uh, of your problem is important. And so if you're primarily concerned about security, for example, there was nothing on the Linux Foundation slide that described tools or technologies that would help you with security. Um, So I, if I took my first slide and I jammed the, the whole bunch of stuff there to the left, there's a whole rich other environment of tools that are also open source. And, and they bind together into, in order to solve other problems. Um, and a lot of the tools in the security world, for example, are at a different scale. They're not talking about several thousand developers collaborating to build an orchestration framework that works together. These are small tools written by a few guys that have grown over time because they're really good. Um, if you talk about white box networking, uh, it's somewhere in between the grand, uh, sort of very large projects that are above and relatively small projects and technologies that are, that are available uh, that you can use in order to put together a white box campus network if you really wanted to. 
And so then you, you say, well, why would I do that? What can I do on campus that's interesting? Why do I want to program it? And often security comes up again. And so things like east-west propagation of viruses on your campus, you can do better if you can, uh, if you can uh, basically segment your campus using your, your layer two switches that are providing all the connectivity. If those switches are able to block viruses as they try to propagate across the campus, now you've achieved something. But how do you do that? Well, you don't go to open daylight <laughs> download it and, and run a cloud orchestrated thingy. Uh, what you do is you write some scripts using the technologies in, in sort of the white box networking box in order to solve that point problem because you're a clever guy and, and you think that you have a way to, uh, to detect good flows from bad flows. Um, and so this sort of is, is the message I'm trying to send you is that sometimes uh, if, you're, if you're like Rich and you, you do want to put a world-class ecosystem together and have Ontario overall be competitive uh, with uh, China or California, uh, then you need to do the things that he's doing, which is bring those large technologies in place, foster them, uh, set them up in these uh, innovation centers, and allow people to attach their smart farms or their smart subways and things to them. That has to be done. but. If you're, if you're working for the Toronto District School Board or the library system or running one campus, those might not be the things that you need. The tools that you want might be a uh, much smaller scale. They might be other open source tools. Um, but the important thing is to first know uh, why you're doing open networking for yourself uh, before feeling any guilt about not contributing to something very large. That's it. Questions? Thanks. That was great, absolutely great, thank you. All right, so the, the last before the lunch break is the journey into SDN. And for this, I'd like to welcome Hadi Banazeda. Hadi is the chief architect of the savvy multi-tier cloud testbed at the University of Toronto. Hadi has more than 15 years experience in computer and telecom networks and in cloud computing. He received PhD degree in electrical and computer engineering from U of T where he developed novel concepts for network architectures that leverage virtualized infrastructure to enable rapid application and creation. This session will look at Savvy's exploration of SDN which is built on the Orion network. Let's welcome Savvy. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. So uh, I, in this talk, I'm going to go over um, what we did as part of the Savvy project, uh, introduced the Savvy project uh, that was headquartered at the University of Toronto and had many uh, uh, partners, uh, both in academia and in industry. And also talk about TestFest and some of the stuff that we did in uh, the um, as part of the SDN project that we were running on that testbed. And I'm hoping to be able to show uh, some uh, recorded demos of those uh, things that we did. So this is my uh, this is not my laptop. So I hope the uh, demo videos would play well on this laptop. So what is Savvy? Savvy stands for Smart Applications on Virtual Infrastructure. So it's an NSERC uh, strategic research network. And it was a, a partnership between academia and industry to uh, explore uh, the, the, uh, smart infrastructures and virtualized infrastructures, how to deliver smart applications. So the idea was about 2009, 2010. The project started about 2011. And uh, in that sense, we were uh, one of the uh, early groups that we were focusing on these projects uh, for these types of uh, smart infrastructure, software-defined infra infrastructure in the world. And uh, so the project was a five-year project, and now we, we are in the extension of that project. So the testbeds that we are running, one of the main uh, parts of the Savvy project 
is uh, uh, one of the main goals was to create a test bed for uh, university networking research, mostly uh, uh, the, the type of networking that is not uh, totally uh, bound to what current internet provides. So we wanted to uh, be able to do clean slate uh, network experimentation and network protocol design. Uh, that's uh, part of the research that we did at the University of Toronto, along with uh, other partner universities. So, so as mentioned here, we, we the, the, there were about 10 Canadian universities, uh, researchers from 10 Canadian universities were part of this NSERG strategic network, many partners, many industry partners, and at any point we had a large number of uh, uh, graduate students and postdocs uh, working on different aspects of, uh, of all the way from uh, wireless to uh, to, to a platform design for application to uh, infrastructure and networking and uh, at different universities, different research groups. So that was uh, basically the goal of the uh, Savvy project. So so Savvy, when it came out, it had this view that uh, uh, back then everyone was like saying everything should go to the cloud. And Savvy had a view that uh, in addition to the cloud, the remote data centers, big data centers, you need to have uh, some smaller data centers, again, virtualized, very cloud-like, closer, uh, closer to end users. We call them smart edge. And these, uh, sub, uh, they're good enough to serve a town or a, uh, or, or, a, or a university or some like a good number of users that you would like to have virtualized resources closer to end users. So it's like a, a role of a traditional central office and then you uh, would like to be able to virtualize it, uh, bring those virtualization services closer to end users. Why? To provide uh, smart applications that need responsiveness, needs a shorter round trip time uh, to the end users and also be able to operate in terms of uh, in times of uh, emergency and when you're uh, cut off from the remote cloud so so that's basically uh, the the main idea of the uh, uh, savvy that was we added to the cloud system and then we we envisioned that these smart edges will be connected to higher speed uh, access either uh, wireless or optical and then going to the uh, third tier which was uh, customer premise uh, equipments, small equipments, gateways, IoT gateways, and IoT devices and sensors. So, uh, what uh, we basically the, the the sensor part, the third tier came later, about like 2013, 2014. The the third layer came in, but the Savvy started uh, focusing on the first two tier uh, right off from 2011. So. As part of this uh, 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 Savvy project, we built a test bed that was uh, on many Canadian universities, and it's uh, uh, we had eight nodes in seven Canadian universities, different provinces, all the way to uh, Victoria. We have presence in Victoria. We have presence in Calgary, uh, and Ontario and Quebec, and we are uh, also. Uh, having partnerships with other international uh, uh, research groups that are doing uh, networking research, basically. And we have a node running in Postex South Korea, and we have a node running inside Orion. Uh, the, Orion is one of the main partners of the Savvy project. And um, also we have nodes running on Chameleon and Cloud Lab. These are two other testbeds that is uh, running in US and also connected to the Genie testbed. And it's uh, the the network of these uh, uh, most of these nodes that we have uh, thanks to Orion and Canary, uh, primarily Orion that we have uh, started here from Ontario, connecting Ontario universities as a member of Savvy project. We uh, created a full SDN uh, network, a dedicated layer two network. It wasn't basically uh, IP based network, so these nodes had the layer two connectivity between each other so that we could do uh, uh, the, the type of research that you would do uh, in university, this clean slate research. And uh, Orion and uh, Canary and BCNet, they were involved to, uh, to connect at BCNet to connect to Victoria. Uh, Canary uh, helped us to go outside Ontario and especially to, uh, also to Victoria and to Chicago. That I talk a little bit about it later. So, how much resources we have? So this testbed, we uh, we have quite a good amount of resources. We have about 3,700 uh, cores right now in, in the Savvy testbed in in total in all these resources. The big nodes are in the University of Toronto, and we have. Uh, recently added even more resources. We kind of doubled the amount of resources we had in uh, the, the testbed nodes that we have in University of Toronto. 
and it's uh, a large number of RAMs, uh, 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 storage, and it's all the networking is uh, uh, full SDN. So it's, we started from one gigi, then 10 gigi, and recently we've got quite a few 100 gigi SDN switches. And we, uh, we have very active FPGA research group for acceleration. So they, they have a large number of FPGAs at the uh, part of the computer engineering department in University of Toronto. We have uh, very active on uh, research on, on wireless software defined radios connected to these smart edges. And again, as part of the University of Toronto communications group, uh, they're, co they're connected and they're all, co all connected through um, SDN to these uh, 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 compute and networking and storage resources that is available there. Also, we are expanding toward the IoT and, and we're getting more of these things and uh, uh, connecting them to the to the system. So, as as I mentioned, the uh, Savvy testbed has been federated with Genie, and I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with Genie. Genie is a testbed that started a, a couple of years before us, like about 2000. Uh, eight, something like that. And uh, they, uh, the goal again was to create these uh, networking research tests but, uh, uh, in in United States, uh, c connecting many universities, uh, uh, kind of uh, replicating what uh, uh, Kalina Slate Network was back in the day when, they, uh, when the internet was invented. And uh, so the goal was that to uh, create these universities, put resources in, and allow networking research people to connect it to, uh, to explore new ideas. And uh, again, thanks to uh, um, uh, the, all the col collaborations that we had with the um, US researchers, uh, we were able to federate. So our uh, savvy users right now could use uh, resources that, uh, uh, that are available in the uh, United States, and there are uh, quite a few. Uh, a good amount of resources that are available down there that we have um, all the savvy researchers have access to through these collaborations because uh, we created, uh, we basically kind of federated our user base. And then uh, what um, happened recently, a uh, few uh, months back, is that uh, with uh, again Orion and Canary's help, we got connected at layer two to US through uh, Chicago. Uh, so we have layer two connection in the Chicago. So uh, you could get a resource and go layer two uh, to another resource, another virtual machine, another physical machine in, in, in anywhere in, in US California. And again, through this genie, because many other re uh, research suspects in, uh, across the world are already federated with genie, uh, we uh, are able to uh, uh, operate, uh, federate with, with, with those uh, testbeds uh, as well. That's how we connect to other uh, international testbeds. As a Canadian uh, research testbed uh, representing uh, Canadian researchers and, uh, and the, uh, the, the way we think about the networking in the world. So uh, this is how we did the uh, Layer 2 Federation. So Layer 2 Federation, it was uh, quite a few organizations got involved. Uh, in Canada, we had Orion, and then we had Canary. On the other side, we had the Starlight and Internet, too. From there, we're going to Gini, Chameleon, and Cloud Lab. So many people, many organizations uh, came to, uh, together to uh, create this uh, Layer 2 connection. And for that, we put a software-defined uh, uh, infra infrastructure exchange point. A small node we put in um, in in, in uh, Orion uh, to explore how we could uh, do uh, layer two using software-defined exchanges between these two different networks that we had in Savvy and the Genie network. So uh, administrated differently uh, is a two different domains. So there were quite a few challenges there, and uh, we have been able to publish uh, quite a few papers around that and be able to demo demonstrate what is it uh, what this is about. And um, in, in, in when we go to the conferences in U.S. and all the way to, to show that um, uh, how, what's our view in, in, in terms of software-defined exchange points, which is a very hot area in research in uh, these days. So, so Savvy has a multi-node deployment. So our testbed nodes is we have uh, uh, these edge nodes, and then we have the core nodes. Uh, the core, uh, they're all independently uh, uh, managed and autonomous, so any of them would shut down, the other one would continue. The central nodes are, uh, the central elements are uh, identity access manager, and the portal, and the orchestration service is a test test uh, orchestration service we have, and those are the only uh, logically central components that we have in the testbed. And uh, 
the idea is that each application would come in and get a different amount of resources, virtualized resources on each of these nodes and together would create its own application, distributed application. So what a Savvy node looks like, Savvy node is basically, uh, that's the latest view that you have uh, integration between OpenStack and software defined networking. That's uh, we were uh, uh, working on these uh, uh, converged management uh, early on. Uh, that we were following the community that we were doing uh, these uh, integrations. Uh, uh, so we had our own view. So uh, we we basically uh, created a, uh, an, a, 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 a converged management and integrated management of software defined networking and uh, virtualized. Uh, resources that offers by OpenStack. So that's basically primarily uh, Savvy. As I said, it's uh, all, uh, it's, it's full SDN. So all the nodes have uh, full uh, SDN switches, OpenFlow 1.0, the early ones and recent ones that we uh, acquired, the, the, we purchased, they're all OpenFlow 1.3 that we use in the system. So many uh, projects was, was uh, as part of the uh, Savvy running on this testbed, including orchestration, uh, measurement, uh, monitoring, uh, act very actively uh, about Savvy uh, virtualized customer premise uh, edge and uh, IoT. So our edge is different than virtual customer premise equipment. So that's I could uh, fill you in with more detail uh, after in, in the networking session uh, if you're interested. And on our work in IoT, then we do a lot of big data analysis. We have uh, uh, many uh, NFE uh, projects. Understanding, I would try to show you a demo about that. And we do very active, uh, very uh, leading edge uh, uh, FPGA group. Uh, it's actually the, uh, the when their uh, paper came out about virtu uh, virtualized FPGAs and how what's the role of virtualized FPGAs in future data centers and how to accelerate uh, the tasks that uh, current data centers they have a problem with. The paper came out, and then a few months later, Microsoft announced that uh, the largest FPGA data center they had, and they're for being a research engine running on these F uh, FPGAs in, in the data center. So I think our uh, computer engineering group uh, uh, came out first with these uh, papers on ideas. And uh, another, sister, uh, sister, uh, another sister project of the Savvy is Connected Vehicle and Smart Transportation. It's another uh, five-year project. It started again in 2011. And uh, the goal was to uh, create uh, uh, smart uh, transportation and c smart city applications uh, that could run on this infrastructure. So I have a little bit of a slide on, on that too as well. So. Uh, as I said, I have uh, quite a few demos here, so um, I'm trying to see if, uh, depending, um, so I, I have about uh, 10, 10 minutes, I guess, 10, 15 minutes, so I would use 10 minutes to see how many of these demos uh, I would be able to show to you guys, and if uh, uh, any of them you need uh, uh, to see more details about any other topic, I would be more than happy to, to discuss them and during the uh, breaks. So one of the things that I wanted to show is about the end-to-end -end orchestration. Uh, how we use uh, the, uh, the layer two networks provided by uh, Canary and Orion uh, to, uh, to do research and do uh, uh, work on a uh, new way of uh, transferring uh, information over the wide area networks using uh, software-defined networking. So in, in this view, we have each node, we have a software-defined inf infrastructure manager, we call it SDI manager in each of these nodes. And we have here a node running in uh, Toronto and a node in, in Victoria. And we show how you could uh, do uh, distributed virtual routing uh, uh, using uh, the uh, software-defined networking on these uh, nodes. So the idea is that instead of uh, uh, using layer three routers and uh, IP, IP routers to connect these nodes together at the IP layer, we use the SDN network to directly connect the virtual resources VMs from one node to the other node. So I have to, okay. So it's a little bit this uh, 
player is a little bit weird, but I try to uh, uh, see what I could he do here. So we have a VM here at Victoria and a VM here in, in Toronto, and each of them have the, uh, an IP address in the range that is uh, for 1012 is for uh, Toronto, 106 for uh, uh, Victoria, and they're connected using layer two network that is provided to us. And you see that is uh, the time is about 60, the round trip time is about 60 minutes, 50, 60 milliseconds uh, from here to Victoria. And their TTL reduces by two. That means there are two routers in the path. So that's uh, 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 the current situation. So using uh, Savvy Advanced Services, SDN services, we create a la layer two uh, 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 wide area network, a virtual wide area network. So you would just basically create a, a virtual van. You give it a name and you go around and you add these VMs in Toronto and in uh, Victoria to this virtual van. So here's the VM in, in Toronto, is added to the virtual wide area network, and the other one is goes to Victoria, and you have the VM in Victoria, again added to this virtual wide area network. Okay, so now if you go back and you see these VMs starting pinging each other, so you, you could see is the TTL is 64. So that means that there is no uh, router in the path. So these VMs were able to connect that layer to uh, using a distributed virtual user using software-defined networking services that we put in place. And just to make sure that you can even, it's real, real too, you could even have your private network uh, addresses assigned and you'll be able to directly go at layer two from one to the other. So obviously the impact would be huge performance improvements in terms of you, there's no bottleneck in the path, uh, there's no layer three bottleneck in the path, you go use your uh, maximum speeds that you have at layer two to connect these resources uh, together uh, at maximum uh, link speed that was provided to the switches there. And that's, uh, so that's the first demo. So another uh, uh, demo that I have is about NFE service chaining on the Savvy testbed using SDN again, is that you have uh, on-demand and flexible in, in insertion of NFEs. And uh, so what you have is that, for example, you have a gateway and you have a web server and then you put an uh, open source uh, DPI uh, snort as, a, as an NFE in a VM and you, without uh, knowing, uh, without disruption of service, you put NFE in the path, so you bring the uh, NFE in the path between the gateway and the web server. And also, we have the another demo on how to use, be able to use tapping using a virtual appliance that is uh, specially designed to to tap a traffic. So that's a demo that. So here you could see that we have an OpenStack environment that has, uh, uh, a, 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 I don't know why this, anyway. So you have an OpenStack environment that has SDN uh, enabled in it. And when, it, when a browser sends a request to web server, the request comes uh, through uh, the, uh, the, 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 the gateway routers and then is routed to the SDN, uh, to the web server. And these are all running on OpenStack. And what we have here is a virtual appliance from a company uh, that is uh, specialized in, in developing uh, tapping services. And uh, we did a joint project with them so that uh, they gave us their uh, new, they had just uh, uh, come out with a uh, version of virtual appliance that they had for the uh, tapping. So they, we ran their VM's uh, tapping service in, in, the, in Savvy, and that's how we basically, using SDN, we are allowed, we are, we are, we are on demand, we create the tapping traffic to start uh, tapping the traffic that goes to the web servers without uh, any disruption to the main uh, service path. 
And it's important that because before these uh, virtual appliances and NFE, the tapping service would have been included some physical activity, into including uh, taking the cables and somehow putting a tap, a real physical tap on the path and being able to monitor it using their appliance, uh, their physical appliance. Here, there is no, no such a thing. It's basically all you have is the virtual appliance. So this is the uh, portal to their virtual um, uh, appliance that is uh, uh, running on the VM. And you go to the co conversation, there's nothing going on here because there's no uh, tapping running. And this is the uh, the web server that is basically we would like to tap, which is uh, our own uh, 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 web server that is running running on this page. So as as you could see, nothing is going on. Is we are we are looking at the web server, nothing coming in. So all we go uh, we go to the other page, and you go to our uh, advanced uh, SDN services portal. And you request a tab. So to do so, you pick up the VMs, you create a tab, you give it a name, and you say what you want to tap traffic type TCP port 80. And you create a chain. You say this is the uh, router interface is head of the chain, and the v web server is the gate tail of the chain, and the tapping device is is the tapping device. And then you say you start tapping. Now you go to the web the web server. You start refreshing a few times. And then you go to the uh, the tapping appliance, and you see the traffic is coming in. And this it shows you all the conversation that that web server had uh, on the fly, dynamically using this tapping service that was just uh, deployed on the uh, on this node using these NFE services. And it uh, has all these APIs in terms of bounce diagram and stuff like that. So even if it's, uh, even if the uh, communication is encrypted, uh, uh, using uh, uh, the keys of the servers, you could even decrypt the communication and show the full communications if needed. So that shows the power of uh, how the virtualization and NFE would basically solve the very uh, common problem, how to uh, tap it, the traffic for different uh, purposes, uh, let's say for debugging a problem or something like that. So, okay. hopefully this guy could be here. So uh, the question is about how get these features on on on, on legacy equipment, and we have done uh, uh, quite some work on how to bring bring these advanced services, including tapping, including uh, uh, NFE service changing on on legacy services. So we have a demo on that. I'm not going to show it here, and how we be able to provide an uh, NFE is not on running on DPI on Savitas, but and it's cutting the traffic between a web server and the gateway running on Amazon web server, totally separate than our uh, environment. So this is the CVST project, is that basically uh, I was uh, talking about is, an, uh, uh, is, is basically to create an application for a platform for a smart transportation and a smart city. So as part of this project, the folks who were working on this project, they gathered uh, a large number of uh, uh, feeds uh, from different things, from uh, big sea buses, uh, weather stations, uh, uh, speed uh, uh, sensors, uh, cameras, um, even uh, integrated drones into uh, to, to their portal. So what they did is that they brought in a lot of uh, these different feeds, started doing uh, big data storage on it, and then doing the big data analytics on it, and providing a portal 
to provide this information, the portal is open. It's portal.cvsd.ca. So anyone would be able is now is live, and you could go in and see the portal. Uh, this laptop, unfortunately, doesn't have an internet connection. I would have uh, shown you the live uh, demo of that portal, uh, how many feeds we have, and they're all alive. So it, I suggest you go open it, portal.cvsd.ca. And for example, as part of this data analytics, you could see that in, in this uh, diagram that you have there, it shows that the uh, uh, how patterns of uh, uh, be how patterns of movement in the city of Toronto changes when there is a snowstorm. So in terms of being uh, um, suddenly in the morning, uh, you see all these red that shows that it's uh, the, the congestion because of the snowstorm. And there's nothing going on in the afternoon because probably around noon, everyone went back to home, I guess, after the snowstorm. So, so they do a lot of these data analytics in terms of um, uh, uh, providing these uh, 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 source of information, a huge amount of information, and putting in an open platform so that people would get access to this information through open APIs and be able to develop more smart uh, application for the cities. And uh, using the infrastructure, and, the, and that's my last slide, using the uh, infrastructure and the uh, these applications, the smart city applications that were, was developed as part of this uh, uh, Canadian initiative and across uh, different universities. Uh, we, uh, our next step is how to use this application platforms, open application platform and software defined infrastructure to work toward uh, smart cities. So that's what basically uh, what we're looking at, how to use SDN, IoT and clouds uh, to support the smart cities, uh, especially being a multi-domain uh, in environment to create these uh, shared clusters uh, to be able to uh, use uh, different cities' experience in terms of how they would like to use the applications, uh, develop applications that is uh, usable in other areas. So that collaboration is very really important. And we, in that part, we would like to leverage the federation relationships that we have we have uh, created over the years, uh, especially. Uh, uh, toward the, um, uh, uh, the, there is an initiative in U.S. going on. Is U.S. Ignite is about how to deliver smart cities, the, uh, smart uh, services to smart to uh, smart communities, and they have some uh, candidate cities in the United States. So, so we are working on them uh, with them to uh, be able to work together and have uh, some Canadian uh, 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 partners uh, for uh, in this size of the border with them. Also, we are working on creating these autonomous and integrated management of micro and, uh, um, and uh, macro services. Uh, containers and microservices are uh, very uh, hot areas these days, so uh, we have been moving toward that uh, direction and have a, a quick demo on that as well, and then how to use SDN for providing security, performance, and, and stock. And uh, bottom line is to how to create the open infrastructure and um, application platforms that would be able to collect these da uh, the large amount of data and uh, the, to intelligence to, to basically create the smart cities and have quick application uh, 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 life cycles that is required for uh, these environments. So uh, let me see how I'm doing. Okay, so I have uh, one more demo, but I would show it. Uh, I don't know how much time do you have? Uh, well, lunch is starting in just a few minutes, so I guess it depends on how quick you're... Okay, so I think it's a, it's a one-minute thing, so I would... So this is shows about uh, how we develop using one click. You define your infrastructure that is uh, spanned across multiple these federated environment. And with one click, you basically you say create the infrastructure that you would like it to to uh, run it for IoT platforms, and it starts running things. And it's about five minutes. All the VMs and containers provisioned, and these are going to the Savvy portal, showing all the uh, VMs that are running here. And also, there is a portal that is basically showing us the platform and where the VMs are located and how they're. They're running, so it's all these endpoints of the portals are given in this uh, platform development uh, uh, API, and 
out of that is this platform is auto scale so be able to when you increase the load increase the number of vms on different locations that we have goes up and uh, comes down when the load goes up it's auto scales goes up and then when the load comes down in terms of the number of sensors and so forth comes down and also showing the uh, the the location of these vms for example here we have location in toronto then we have location in chicago vms are running on chicago in terms of the federation work that we did there and how many containers on each vm run, right now running so it fully uh, allows you to see what's going on under the hood in terms of the uh, amount of resources that you're using uh, to be able to monitor it and do some auto scaling on it and also what we have is that here you would have even more detailed about how uh, these containers are connecting together at the container level. So these are microservices that are running on each VM. So, so each VM would be able to run about uh, 10, 20 of these microservices, each one doing different tasks as part of these things. And these are APIs that you, uh, you are able to manage this Docker-based container system using Docker Swarm. Uh, for Docker or, uh, orchestration. So uh, if if you need uh, to know any more of uh, detail about these uh, any of these projects, I would be more than happy uh, to share more with you guys uh, during the break uh, and the networking session and the panel. So thank you very much. Thank you. Great. Thank you for having me. Excellent. Thank you. So that's it. Now we're starting our lunch session, and the Leadership Awards will start at 12.15. I'd like to welcome everybody back here for a Future of SDN panel starting at 1 o'clock. So have a great lunch, and we'll see you soon.